Welcome. I'm Sean Wilkerson, Innovation Development Program Manager here at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, otherwise known as USPTO. I want to thank you all for joining us today for the Women's Entrepreneurship Symposium. We're excited to have you here for the second in our series of discussions being held every Wednesday in March celebrating Women's History Month. Before we start the program, Pathways to Invention, Entrepreneurship, and STEM Careers for K-12 through and Beyond, I have a few housekeeping notes to go over. The agenda for today's program is in the inbox of everyone who registered for the program. However, it can also be found online at www.uspto.gov. During the panel, we will be accepting questions by email. So if you'd like to submit a question to our panel today, you can provide that question by sending an email to wes at uspto.gov. We will try to get to your question and answer all of your questions at the end of each panel. If not, we'll try to answer those questions after the panel today. If for any reason you get disconnected today during the program, you can log back into the program at any time via the WebEx portal that brought you here. If you miss a portion of today's program, don't worry. We will be posting today's program online on our website in just a few days. If you're urgently ready to see that information again, you can always go to our Facebook page for USPTO, where the Facebook page is being streamed for our presentation today, and you'll be able to see that video right away. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our panel moderator, Joyce Ward. Joyce Ward is the director of the Office of Education here at USPTO. And at this time, I'd like to make sure all of our panelists have their microphones and cameras turned on. And Joyce, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, I am uh, delighted to be here today um, with this wonderful panel of women who uh, are going to talk with us about pathways uh, to expanding innovation. But the exciting thing is that each one of them uh, are trailblaz trailblazers and are actually actively engaged in creating pathways and on their own pathways. So we want to start out uh, first by asking each one of our panelists to introduce themselves and to tell you a bit about themselves. And so we're going to go in alphabetical order here. I'm going to start with Carol Dahl. Great, thank you, Joyce. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and with such a great group of women. Uh, so I'm uh, Carol Dahl, I'm Executive Director at the Lummelson Foundation and our mission is to improve lives in, through invention. So we have a lot in common with the USPTO and we do that through supporting the education and cultivation of the next generation of inventors, as well as supporting the pathway that allows them to take their ideas and turn them into products and businesses with impact. So I'm a scientist by training. I have both my undergraduate and graduate degrees in life sciences. I think I came to that because most of the people in my extended family are in some way involved in healthcare. Um, but I didn't end up in healthcare. I actually ended up as a scientist because an undergraduate, I began to do research and I just fell in love with that. So I started with a kind of traditional career. I was on the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. But at the time I was there, uh, the Human Genome Project was starting, and I got very excited because I saw what well, transformational that was going to be. So I left academia to go to the National Institutes of Health, where I worked on the Human Genome Project, um, and there was involved in shaping uh, programs to invest in cutting-edge technology to both decipher the genome, but then to use that to actually improve therapy, diagnosis, and health in general. I saw how important inventors and companies and entrepreneurs were, and that became a passion for me. It's really followed me through my life. I also was working with the Advanced Technology Program in the Department of Commerce while I was there, which was um, investing in incentivizing companies to invest in breakthrough technologies. So my tie to entrepreneurship and the importance of industry really, really birthed there for me. I moved to the National Cancer Institute to help bring these cutting edge technologies, the genomic approach to the National Cancer Program, and there got involved in launching programs around complex molecular technologies and imaging technologies and so on. Also involved with working with corporate partners to ensure uh, we, we had progress against the National Cancer Mission. Um, 
I did leave the Cancer Institute to help start a diagnostics company. So I, I had spent some life being a, a bit of an entrepreneur, really learned about what it takes to build an enterprise, the risks, the challenges, as well as the excitement of building something new. But I got an offer while I was there that I couldn't refuse, which was to launch the Grand Challenges programs at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I spent eight years at the Gates Foundation bringing novel technologies and new solutions to neglected problems in low and middle income countries. All of that basically took me down a path where I became um, you know, very interested in innovation, invention, how we turn inventions into solutions that really reach people. And that led me to my current role, which has the additional advantage of being able to also help with fostering the next generation of inventors. I guess I've always been a bit of an entrepreneur, whether it's building or joining something fundamentally new but also an entrepreneur building new things within an organization. I feel super lucky to have had the opportunity to do that as well as to help invest in others who have great ideas to bring them to fruition as entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That is outstanding. And it's, it's, it's very uh, nice to see just the, the pathway and um, the various experiences that you bring to the discussion. And I love the fact that you talked about always being an entrepreneur as well as an entrepreneur. And so the next one of our panelists that I want to introduce to you is Rosalind Goodwin. Uh, and I had the pleasure of speaking with Rosalind's daughter um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, just very anxious uh, to have you tell us about um, yourself and certainly about what you're doing with your daughter as well. Rosalind Listen. Goodwin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It really is an honor to be on such an esteemed panel with amazing women um, this Women's History Month. My name is Rosalind Goodwin. I live in Columbia, South Carolina. I am a first generation entrepreneur, raising a second generation entrepreneur. Our journey started when she was just seven years old. Uh, at five, she daily uh, nagged us about these barrettes that would not stay in her hair um, or I was aggravated by the Brits that would not stay in her hair. And after a social media exchange with a number of moms and a suggestion from our pastor to that this should maybe be a market we break into, Gabby at five asked me every day about these magical Brits that we would create that would stay in her hair. That led to a two year journey to invent the perfect hair bow and uh, Gabby bows were born. Uh, it is a hair barrette a double face, double snap hair barrette, guaranteed non-slip barrette that we have patents on. Uh, so I've now got a 14 year old with three patents. Um, we started the company, uh, Confidence, with that invention, but it, it's expanded beyond that. We now have a full line of plant-based girls natural hair care products. Our entire mission is to remove stress from the styling process so moms, dads, and girls can cherish this precious time they have together doing hair with their girls. During the day, I am a, a vice president and lobbyist for the South Carolina Hospital Association. So I'm a, I'm a healthcare policy wonk and have been in that for over 20 years. So I'm excited to share just from a, a mom who um, wanted to show her daughter that nothing was impossible and that she could solve problems. Uh, my perspective as now an inventor as well. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Rosalind. And uh, then our third panelist is um, Ruth Farmer. Uh, I, have, I have had the pleasure of working with Ruth in various capacities over the years. And so Ruth Farmer, why don't you tell us about yourself? You're, you're muted. Okay. Um, it's really here to find Rosalind's story. Here, it's fun to hear Rosalind's story because I got my start in this space, um, creating an invention camp for girls with the Girl Scouts back in 2001. And it was just transformational to see how just letting girls know that they could change their environment and that if something didn't work for them, that they could create something and fix it. And I'm still in touch with all of those girls who back in 2001 were inventing solutions um, for their lives and, and for the lives of the people around them. 
And um, so I am not a technical person like um, Carol. I actually have my background in marketing and communications, but I like to say that I manufacture engineers and I um, have spent almost 20 years now working on ways to increase girls' participation in technology and engineering pathways. Um, I was at the Girl Scouts for seven years working on I actually rejected the STEM label and I focused exclusively on tech and engineering. Um, one of the big achievements there was establishing the robotics programs within Girl Scouting. And now we have some 78 badges related to engineering in the Girl Scout movement, which is super exciting because that will reach literally millions of girls every year forever and in every zip code. Um, I was uh, with the National Center for Women in IT for nine years, building up programs specifically related to girls and women, um, sort of K through 20 in the um, computer science space. Um, joined the White House to lead tech inclusion for President Obama in 2016. And then um, started working with an organization called CSNYC, which together with the leadership there, we pivoted that organization from focusing just on New York City, which arguably is as big as an entire state school system, if you look at New York City public schools, to um, bringing that knowledge to the whole nation for how to um, do systems change for computer science education. And then my most recent um, thing is I just launched something called the Last Mile Education Fund, um, which um, is really from learning 20 years of watching girls go through the gauntlet of becoming an engineer and seeing the different gaps and places where we're failing. One big one is we're doing a great job of getting more girls and women into the pipeline. We're not doing a great job of getting students out the other end. And so the Last Mile Education Fund funds the last mile for low income tech and engineering women. Uh, right now, we'll probably be expanding to fund young men soon. Um, but you know, a, a little obstacle can be a huge obstacle when you're in those last few months and those last few credits. And um, so we're getting students over the last mile and into a career. And um, on Monday, it was announced that we're a finalist for the $40 million Equality Can't Wait Challenge, which will award $10 million to three different organizations to improve women's power and influence. So we're super excited about that. And I'm excited to be part of this conversation today. Very good. That is all very exciting, uh, Ruth. Um, and we thank all three of you for being here today. So we we want to start the discussion. Um, there was a recent uh, report that was published by the Council on Competitiveness, and we're very fortunate in that. I know that Carol Dahl um, is instrumental um, in working with that group, and so I'm hoping that Carol will will help set the stage for us. But uh, but basically the the thing that I wanted to highlight in there is that um, there's language that um, that that basically says that um, we want to ensure that every student um, has the opportunity to experience invention and innovation throughout uh, pre-K-12 and higher education. And um, I guess my question is, how do we do that and why is it important? And so, Carol, I'd, I'd like you to start out, if you will. Great, thanks, Joyce. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm going to take just a little bit of time to frame why this report is so important and why the report was actually even done. So thank you for mentioning it. I think it is a really important and breakthrough report. Just to provide a bit of context, the Council on Competitiveness is a membership organization that is comprised of leadership of industry, universities, national laboratories, and labor unions. And it, it was formed uh, decades ago with a mission uh, to inform and advise the nation on the needs to ensure U.S. competitiveness. So in late 2019, they formed a commission on innovation and competitiveness frontiers on how to tackle um, how the U.S. can really strengthen and create a more resilient innovation ecosystem to ensure future global competitiveness for the US. And as Joyce mentioned, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this. I'm actually a commissioner um, and involved with this uh, activity. And I think it's, it's really important. So the report highlights 
the importance of fostering innovation. And why is that so important? I guess that's really fundamental to our discussion today. And it is that it leads to high quality jobs. And when you think about high quality, it's not just about having a job, it's about having a good job. And it turns out innovation workers earn a median salary of like 85,000 in 2017 in contrast to all other workers where it was more like 38,000. So definitely higher quality jobs creates new industries, more resilient economy, essential for addressing key challenges we may face as a society. Certainly seen that in the pandemic without vaccines, diagnostics, et cetera, we'd be in trouble. But of course, innovation runs dry without the engine of invention. So invention is critical to this as well. The bottom line is our nation is falling behind. At the end of the last century, we were the world's leader by far and away in investing in research and discovery that drives invention and innovation and inventions per capita. But that's not the case anymore. So the report has identified 50 priority recommendations on how to strengthen innovation and competitiveness in the US. And if people are interested, it's at uh, www.compete.org. And it's called Competing in the Next Economy. And I'd like to focus on three themes, and then I'm going to turn to your question, Joyce. So just the three themes are the following that I think are really important in the report. The first is that there are opportunities to enhance our innovation efforts, both in the innovation path, where we take ideas and inventions and turn them into products and businesses. We talk about that a lot. But what we don't talk about a lot is also the importance of the path, the educational process that cultivates the needed talent. So we need to strengthen both aspects of that. So the second point I want to make is that it's critical in order to cultivate more and more diverse individuals prepared to invent and be inventors and entrepreneurs, we need to make some specific changes in our approach to education. It's not just more of the above, more of what we're doing, but really change it. And so I'm, I'm sure we will get to that in a moment. Um, the third thing is that we need to make a more supportive and inclusive environment for all inventors, innovators, and entrepreneurs to take their ideas into those products and businesses. And currently, it is not an inclusive environment. In fact, women and people coming from low-income communities, communities of color, um, also rural communities, just don't have the same access to take their ideas into impact. So the question around experiencing invention and innovation, there's a growing community of practice among educators who have introduced invention education into their classrooms and after and out of school programs as well. And we're seeing, they're seeing remarkable results. So we really have been learning through them. Uh, what it is, is that they're using invention education. So what is that? It's literally the experience of inventing, going through the iterative innovation process where an idea is reduced to practice and exploring routes to make sure that you can identify a path to taking it to those people who might want it. So the elements of entrepreneurship, you know, it integrates design thinking, STEM, engineering, computer science, a range of disciplines from the social sciences, and it's hands-on and problem-based. But what really distinguishes it from a lot of other hands-on type programs or the kind of education we tend to introduce now generally is it starts with students identifying problems that they see as worth solving and really unpacking those problems in the context of those who might want the solution. So it's quite different from current approaches to education that start with a problem someone else has defined, which the child may or may not care about, may have no cultural relevance to them, um, and then a strict rubric for how to solve it. So really allowing them to define it themselves. And what we're seeing is that kids who go through this, starting early and ongoing, it changes their perceptions of what their own potential and empowerment is. They see that they can change the path, their career opportunities. They also get more interested in learning and self-learning, or particularly around STEM, and they cultivate mindsets and skill sets that CEOs of innovation-based companies say they're looking for in their recruits and, and workforce. I think the critical thing, just to come close here, is that you know, it's reaching kids early with the experience, as data suggests, that kids make their decisions early like by middle school, about what they're not good at. And there are lots of cues and messages that are given earlier on in their educational process to girls and kids from underrepresented minorities, kids in rural settings, that they are not right for the innovation jobs of the future. So we can change that by early exposure, ongoing exposure. And so the commission makes that point to reach all students, not just those from you know, high income communities, not just boys, um, but all students from pre-K to 12 
into higher education with an invention education experience, and that way expand the number of girls and students from historically underrepresented minorities involved in invention, innovation, entrepreneurship. It's gonna strengthen our country, give those individuals an opportunity for really high quality jobs and being part of the future innovation economy. Thank, thank you, Carolyn. As you were talking, I couldn't help but think um, Rosalind Goodwin is a case study <laughs> <laughs> on invention education, and um, she's doing all the right things uh, when you talk about nurturing a child's interest. Um, uh, Rosalind, I'd love for you to tell us more about your case study and what you and your daughter, uh, Gabby, are doing not only to um, serve as examples, but also to encourage others along the way. Absolutely, and I'm definitely seeing the resilience uh, and the, the, the potential for high earning, uh, even with our daughter. Our daughter, uh, growing the business, patenting and invention, she was able to hit six figures by the sixth grade. Uh, so it's not just for our economy in our country, uh, but it is on an individual level that some of the same things that Carol was talking about for our country and why it's beneficial for our country as a whole, as our economy, that is the impact it has on our children. Uh, so we, we've certainly gone through that and, you know, experienced the challenges, all of the hurdles that are there and uh, the lack of access to capital and funding and, and how my husband and I basically just had to pull money out of retirement to to give birth to this dream our daughter had, you know, we, we can talk about the hurdles and the challenges that are there. Uh, but, you know, we've been on a mission since then and instituted in 2018, the Mommy and Me Entrepreneurship Academy. We are really trying to, and this is what Gabby's request to, to me and her dad was, as we were traveling the country and she was speaking and, and you know, inspiring girls, um, she wanted girls who looked up to her to know and to figure out how to be CEOs just like her. Um, so she has a very unique story that she started when she was seven and you know, she really just wanted to solve a problem and inspire people, uh, but she was also extremely shy. <laughs> uh, Joyce, you just met her, so you probably don't believe this. Uh, and if you've ever seen her on camera now, you're like, no way. Uh, but her first video shoot, when she was seven, right when we were launching, she cried the entire time and I had to take over her lines. Uh, but innovation, solving problems, um, all that comes with owning a business, starting a business, having to pitch an idea that nobody else sees but you, builds up that confidence and courage that now she's a traveling keynote speaker. Um, so all of those things developed, but she wanted all of the girls who looked up to her to also be CEOs like her. So we created um, an academy, a mentoring academy to help girls and their moms start their own businesses with our help under the brand. Um, so that exposes these girls directly to a mentor in Gabby, where she has you know monthly calls with them, where we've had to postpone, but we are gonna have hopefully this year, a retreat with them. Um, and these girls are learning how to uh, sell through e-commerce. They're learning how to pitch their products face-to-face -face at vendor shows. Uh, so we're, we're exposing them to those. And what we're seeing in that academy is that they're coming up with ideas and concepts and they're seeing problems that they want to solve. You know, Gabby solved a problem. I have problems every day. <laughs> what, what type of problem can I solve? And they see the example that, okay, here's a little girl who looks like me. Um, she did it, I can do it too. So the exposure, is just invaluable for people to look at looks like them who does something that they only dream of doing. And it's not just something in a history book and it's not so far away that we only celebrate it a certain month out of the year and it's Black History Month. So yeah, we're gonna celebrate the person who invented the traffic light. But no, I'm seeing a real life example. I have someone coming to my school who's doing the school assembly and she started a, a business and had an invention and a patent at seven. Like, I, I think that's kind of where we start. We've got to really lift up the stories like this and support the companies like this. You know, God forbid, I don't want anybody, <laughs> any other family um, to go through all that we went through to help our daughter's dream come true. Uh, so we got to really encourage that, expose children to that, but then support the support system 
for those children through their parents, through their Girl Scout troops, uh, through the, the organizations in the communities that will really help them continue to innovate, invent, and help change the world. Thank you, Rosalind. And um, Ruth, I know that you have worked in a number of areas and you've been able to pull in students and programs that haven't been served before or that that people have not targeted. Could you talk a little bit about some of the work that, that you've been able to do and, and certainly chime in with regard to what Rosalind and Carol have mentioned? Yeah, actually, one thing that both Rosalind and Carol talked about was the, you know, the students responding to problems that are relevant to them. And I remember, so years ago, Intel had given a grant to the Girl Scouts to increase girls' participation in the science and engineering fair in the engineering and computer science and math categories. And that was what ended up becoming the design and discovery program. And I remember the first time we show up at the science fair, and it's the science fair, so everything science, science, science. And I was like, okay, girls, your projects are engineering. We printed out a thing that's like, this is the engineering design process. So when people come talk to you, this is why you explain why you don't have a hypothesis because you're doing an engineering project. And there was another class that came in. Every single kid had done make a bridge out of popsicle sticks and see how strong you can make it. It was exactly the same product. Like, and those kids didn't have any skin in the game. They just didn't care. And I remember my my little girls, um, all kinds of different inventions that they'd come up with. Um, but one was a girl who played the bass. And when you play the bass, you have to hold your hand in this weird, like kind of nanu nanu way. And her teacher would put rubber bands around her fingers to get her to hold the hand position. So after lots and lots of materials engineering experiments, she came up with what she called base space, which was a flexible plastic device for holding your hand position. Well, I just saw something just like that swing by me on wish.com on an advertisement on Facebook. And I was like, that, this 12 year old came up with that way back in, in 2001. And um, I'm seeing all these things popping up now, you know, remote control, uh, wireless Christmas tree lights, other things that girls were thinking of back then. And um, I think we're missing out as a country when we don't access all of our talent. We're leaving, you know, we can mix up all kinds of metaphors here, but leaving a lot of the team on the bench, right? And so um, women are not an underrepresented minority. Women are half of humanity one half and 100 percent of the mothers of humanity so like this is not a niche market that we need to do something special for like this is half the team now if you add up all of the people that are typically excluded from the innovation pathways we're looking at 75 percent of the population women people of color people with disabilities and so you know when carol was talking about global competitiveness in the united states it's like more than half of the kids in the United States today are on free lunch. So we have a real issue if all of the pathways into these jobs that are gonna be very high performing, that are gonna bring people's innovative minds to the design table that's gonna create technology that's gonna help all of us. If we're leaving out half of kids because they don't have financial access to the pathways. Um, that's just a, a really foolish way to go about things. And so I think, um, you know, given what's gone on in the country in the last 12 months or so, you know, the borders are effectively closed and we're not, you know, using migration as a way of increasing talent, you know, the H1B visas and so on. Like you're not gonna fill are um, these innovation roles with international talent anymore. Um, one, because of COVID, two, because of other immigration policies and things going on. But also, you know, we've got the people right here in this country. You know, we have millions of really qualified people. And the other thing that I think is missing from the conversation 
every piece of research says that diverse teams make better stuff. Every, all the research, nobody argues that. The United States uniquely has a native diverse population in our country, and we are not leveraging that competitive advantage. We are not investing in the home team that is black and brown and women and men and all the people that we could be engaging in our economy. And so I think um, some of the things I'm really proud of, one, obviously all the work with the Girl Scouts, because I'm really interested in permanent change. Like if we make computing and engineering and invention a regular part of being a Girl Scout, it's there for every American girl forever, right? Other places that are doing that, Boys and Girls Club, 4-H, all these organizations that serve literally millions of kids all the time forever and have over 100 years of experience, that's a great place for us to put this because what we want is longitudinal experiences. Um, sending a kid to an invention camp is like sending a kid to horse camp who's never going to own a horse. Like, if you want them to keep going, there needs to be some touch points. So that's got to be part of school. It's got to be part of out of school. There's got to be pull through. And um, that's critical. Role models, as Rosalind was saying, super critical. We want to see role models for the kids. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, Patent Office has these great inventor trading cards, but also like who are the young inventors? Um, when I talk to kids, I'm like, I want to be a YouTube star. Well, that's because that's what they're seeing. That's what they're seeing as, as having value. And, and then finally, um, one thing I just want to flag is a, a recent project that I've been doing with the federal government, even though I don't work for the government anymore, um, with uh, the junior ROTC. There are 545,000 kids in the junior ROTC, and they are more than half minority. They're more than half on free lunch. But these are young people who've already raised their hands to be leaders. They've already raised their hands for public service. And um, so I've been working with um, Senator Rosen's office and Representative Brown from Maryland and um, a whole cohort of, of corporate partners to make sure that every JROTC cadet in the United States has access to computer science education in their school. Because um, these are young people that have raised their hand to serve the country and what better way to do that than to contribute to technology. So it sounds like we need the technology piece and the computer science piece because we know that our jobs and our lives are changing, but we also know that invention uh, comes in many forms. And um, there are a lot of different aspects of invention and certainly of entrepreneurship. Um, Carol, how do we, how do we get more um, emphasis on um, the invention and entrepreneurship education um, uh, topic areas um, throughout. I think you mentioned in the beginning that the way we approach things from an academic standpoint, um, that we have to look at, at how this matter is integrated. So what are some of your ideas or suggestions for, for ways to, to make sure that we're getting invention education to more populations, especially to girls? Uh, you know, it's a great, great question, um, Joyce. I, I think the important thing is the only way we're going to reach all students is actually by going through the public systems. Um, you know, there are kids right now who are getting this exposure, but they are by and large either in affluent communities or they are in private schools or so on. And and we really need to reach children at the place where we know we can reach them all, which is the public school system. So I think there is um, opportunity to bring education, invention experiences and education into the classroom, in addition to the after school programs. And, you know, it's only a very small portion of our educational process that actually happens in the classroom, but it is the one that reaches all students. Um, making sure that there are all of these out of school experiences as well that they can tap into is really important. But I think a critical thing is to step back and realize in order to bring it into the educational system, we actually need to have both examples of what works, right? And, and there are examples out there and there's um, actually free curriculum available. Um, there's a site called inventioneducation.org uh, where people can find stories of students and stories of the educators themselves and what they see as the benefits, but also can find free educational materials there. 
but we need more of that. We need to be able to bring that in. We need the kind of space in the school day that will allow this kind of integrative student-led learning to happen. But that also means that we need to provide resources to help provide professional development. This is not the way educators are taught to teach. Um, they are now kind of like the sage on the stage. They stand up there. They're supposed to know everything. They're supposed to you know, bring a rubric and kids are supposed to perform according to that rubric. And um, in fact, this really puts you in the guide on the side. I mean, you know, if a student came up to me and said she wanted to invent a better hair barrette, I would have no clue to how to go about doing that. I don't have a rubric, right? But, but it is to help guide them in that self-learning as, as the wonderful example we have here today on the panel, right? But to help them in that learning they wanna do. And we see students who are wanting to create all kinds of things to either help their own communities or communities they see in need. But that needs to change the school day as well. So I think, you know, we need the freedom in the schoolrooms to do that. We need government and other types of also philanthropic support and so on to provide resources to get these programs off the ground, to get the metrics, the research that needs to be done supported, and then to get the curriculum out there, but also to provide the professional development for the educators so that they're prepared for this very open-ended, potentially uncomfortable way of teaching um, that's actually very liberating because they see such transformation in the kids. Um, so I think those are major pieces. I just want to emphasize also, though, that there's opportunity for everybody in the community to play a role, right? Because the parents need to be supportive. It, it takes extra time and effort for kids to be able to immerse in this sort of thing. And, and the kind of wonderful support that we see that Alison has provided for her daughter, right? Parents need to see the opportunity for their kids to have this experience. I also think that, you know, community members like companies and businesses need to provide opportunities for students to see examples of people in these careers, to provide resources, access to facilities, um, you know, summer internship programs and so on that will allow kids to go on that path as well. So lots of opportunity there to make change. I want to add something to that, that to something Carol said sort of sparked something was just this um, letting educators know and parents know that it's hard, but you're really just sort of playing like a concierge role, like an advisor role. And the hardest thing with this um, program I launched with the Girl Scouts Design and Discovery was the fact that every student was doing a different project. And so I swear we were like driving back and forth to the hardware store all day long because <laughs> we were trying to, you know, you couldn't know what the supplies would be. You couldn't predict. And so I think that can be challenging. Um, that's one of the really nice things about computing is when what you're inventing is ones and zeros, um, the supplies are not a constraint, right? The physical supplies. And the other thing I'd add is with parents, I think, we all have to sort of hold back our need to like control and and just let them play around and break things and make a mess and and it's okay and explore. And I remember a commercial that came out a while back that was about, you know, with a girl where the parent was constantly like, oh no, that's not safe or no, that let your brother do that. And those kinds of things that we've all had indoctrinated into us you really have to encourage that exploration and that starts very early early as seven or younger as Rosalind said um, and that's sometimes a hard thing for adults to do thank you Ruth and and Rosalind I know one of the things that well several things struck me as I talked with Gabby but one of the things she said is you know at first I think my mom thought of this as a science experiment and so <laughs> you know I was always working on this I was collecting the data I was you know trying to figure out what worked and, and she shared um, you getting different products for her to examine um, could you tell us sort of about your iterative process about the the way that you had Gabby or the way that you and Gabby together, I guess, kind of as that guide on the side, how did you work together to uh, to come up with your solution? Right, I, honestly, I did think it was a science project. I, um, as I mentioned, first generation entrepreneur and even 
as we were talking about the idea, I did have the thought that, wow, you know, if we come up with something, maybe we can sell it. We can sell the idea to an established company because I certainly couldn't think about starting our own company. I, I just had not been exposed to it. Uh, so it really was just us sitting down at the kitchen table uh, and, and gathering various types of barrettes that we already had in our home. And then we went to the store to buy some others and we'd send her to school with certain barrettes and say, okay, how did these come? How did, how many of these came back today? <laughs> these hung on. So let's make some observations about what it was. And at the level of her age comprehension, you know, she would say, well, maybe it's these spiky things that's on the face. It's okay. Teeth. So let's write down teeth. Teeth are important. Um, my mom, her grandmother had a pet peeve about barrettes that was flip and you would just see the strip on the back. Uh, and she just constantly, every time she saw Gabby and her, the barrette was turned around and you couldn't see the design, you just saw the ugly strip on the back, she'd retwist her hair and say, you know, Rosalind, you don't know how to twist her hair that the barrette design is always seen. So that was one of the things we wrote down. So we got to get rid of that problem. I don't want my mom embarrassing me and redoing my daughter's hair every time I see her. So we've got to create something that has two faces. So anytime the hair turns, you're always able to see the design. So we literally were just writing down observations, testing different barrettes um, and said, okay, we got to come up with something that has the teeth, that has room for the hair to be wrapped around the center strip. Uh, that has two faces so you can always see the design. So by the time you've had all of these things we wanted to have on the barrette to make it work and stay in, we just kind of started just kind of drawing. Okay, what would that look like if it's going to have all these things? Okay, so it, it probably has to have two faces. So two faces are going to look like this. And, and literally the first idea we had was two faces sticking out like this and then a center strip in the middle. Um, and um, the the final thing, I thought I had it with me. I don't know what it did with it. Um, it's something that looked a little different that we had to have our engineers and manufacturers help us work through. Um, but that was literally the, the, the science project of sitting down at the kitchen table um, and trying to figure out what that is, a science project with observations, uh, and then enlisting help. Because uh, we had the idea, but neither one of us could really draw. Uh, so I uh, reached out to an artist who was at our church and said, you know, can you sit down with me for about 30 minutes to an hour? I have an idea in my head. And he was able to come up with a 3D image of what I have right here before you. That's something that folds more so like an N or a Z. Um, but that is literally the process. It took us about two years um, because we certainly had a number of hurdles. I didn't know who to reach out to and the people who I reached out to. Uh, were probably more discouraging than encouraging. Um, and But we, we made it through, we, we persevered, and uh, she's definitely an example for other girls to look at now. And, and I'm, I'm very curious because um, uh, two things I will say why this is extremely interesting to me. Um, I'm much, much older than Gabby and probably more so than, than you all as well. Uh, but I remember you know, my mom talking to me when I would come home without those little barrettes because they were a big thing even way back then. And it was always a struggle. And I also remember the fact that, you know, it only showed on one side. So that's very relatable um, to me. And I suspect it's very relatable to other students and to children because, again, um, you and Gabby identified a problem that they could relate to. Um, and I think um, there's a lot of difference when there's a problem or there's an issue that is personal. Um, you're a lot more invested. That's why Gabby I was asking you about this every day, I guess. Um, you're a lot more invested in it. But I'm, I'm really curious to know, because you are in the South, in South Carolina, I believe you made it, how, um, how did you go about finding um, uh, support or help for um, or to try to get this product into market areas. I, I read an article in the, the Washington Post kids section a couple of, of, um, of weeks, of, well, I guess about a month ago. So I know that you're now in a major big box store. And so um, I'm just curious, how did you do that from rural South Carolina um, to the point of getting this into um, a major uh, market? 
that first I, I did that I had about selling it, I, I literally would take my lunch break and I, I had a company in mind that uh, once we came up with the concept, so I'm going to pitch, I'm going to get in front of the right person. I don't know exactly who to talk to, but I'm going to keep calling every day until I find that person. It took me about six months, but I did find that person who explores new ideas. And we had submitted the drawing um, and anybody listening, please don't do what we did. <laughs> we had submitted this drawing of our idea, no, no protection, no patent, no nothing. It was just sitting out this 3D image of our idea to companies and their idea database. Um, and it's it's only by the grace of God that Gabby Bowes aren't just like all over the place and Gabby has nothing to do with them because we were literally just sending them out. We didn't know about patent trademark office and <laughs> how to protect our idea at the time. Uh, but we actually, I got to that person uh, and the concept of the idea of the double face, double snap red was taken before a focus group of this major established hair accessory company. Uh, it went through about a, a few rounds and at the end it didn't meet their strategic plan as far as what they were going to be investing in. So he, you know, turned us down. I was uh, just torn to pieces, just shattered because that's all I had in mind was selling this idea and putting some money aside for Gabby, Gabby's college fund. That's all I could think about. Uh, but of course, today you see that that is not the path that we had uh, that was in store for us. But that person at that company, I told them, you know, when he called me and told me, I'm sorry, this is not something that fits along with our strategic plan. But, you know, thank you for going through this process with us. I said, wait a minute. My daughter's at home every day asking me about this barrette. You can't just hang up on me. You've got to help me make one bet barrette. And these are my exact words. You got to help me finish the science project. And he said, ma'am, you can't understand how much money it's going to cost you to finish this little science project. I said, well, I mean, I can't let my daughter down. I can't show her that, you know, things get hard and people tell you no and you quit. We got to at least finish the science project. He said, you're going to have to get a mold. You're going to have to get engineers. You're going to have to get a manufacturer. I, said, I don't know what that costs, but I can't go home and tell my daughter because you said no, we quit. Um, so he was the one who gave us some recommendations of engineers that were close to us in Charlotte, North Carolina. Those engineers connected us to our manufacturers. We're literally working with the same engineers and manufacturers today. Our score, um, we have a score mentor, our small business development office uh, is still a great support to us. Our city and our mayor um, support just came out of the woodwork because we networked and we went out there. You know, Gabby was pitching in front of one million cups uh, we were having meetings with banks, and now most of them turned us down for money, uh, but we established some really good relationships that they were able to refer us to other people who could help us along this seven-year journey. Um, so it took persistence. It took just continuing to talk about it and get in front of the right people, but eventually people were aiding us um, and helping us get through a number of the hurdles that we had as far as financing, manufacturing, and knowing what next steps to take. Thank you. you know, Joyce, I, I just jump in here to say sure. that Rosalind's story is so compelling because it really tells the story of not only do you need the inspired student, obviously you and your daughter are really inspirational, I'm just taken away with your story, but also this challenge of the downstream um, is really, really hard. I mean, the statistics are really against women and certainly against women of color um, and girls of color. I can't even imagine what the statistics are there for someone so young. But, you know, in terms of dollars that have gone to female led startups, only about 2.3 percent of all the dollars are going there. And um, when you look at female and male co-founded companies, even it's only 9 percent. And as you know, Joyce, I mean, in terms of invention, um, even though women are more than half of the college educated workforce and not even talk about girls, right? Girls are a whole different category. Only 21% of the patents are from female inventors as, as the you know, primary inventor and only 12% of all inventors are women. So we are not uh, taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, I just think your, your story is so inspiring because you these downstream hurdles are equally large, um, even if you have a great idea. So very impressive. Well, and I, I, I was struck by that as well, and that there's a hidden curriculum, right? And, and I think what Rosalind's story really illustrates is the 
the immense role that social capital and networks plays in being successful at this. And, and you know, it's not that um, underrepresented groups like women and people of color don't have the great ideas or don't have the drive. It's that you didn't happen to know that person who knows that manufacturer or knows that, you know, and when you, um, when you, you know, look at the story of Spanx, you know, the story of the founder of Spanx that like she went to manufacturer and after manufacturer to say like, this is an idea that I think is going to work. And they all said, no, 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 never sell. And then it was a female employee who was like, yeah, I would buy that product that got that first manufacturer to say yes. And, um, and mm -hmm. for people who have um, affluent networks, it's, it's easier for others to say yes to them um, because they're doing a favor for somebody else in their network. It's easier for others to bet on them. And, and so we really need to broaden our minds about who has potential. And I think that's the, the key takeaway. That's so true. Absolutely, I would agree. Now, I, I want to, to mention that uh, the US Patent and Trademark Office um, has formed a national council for expanding American innovation. And it consists of people from industry, uh, from other government agencies, from nonprofit organizations, from academia. And one of the things that that uh, national council has been charged with is developing a national strategy uh, to expand um, innovation. And the question that I have for, for you uh, ladies is, um, what do you think we need to do as a as a country as a nation to expand innovation we've heard from Rosalind that um it it there were a number of of i don't want to say barriers or hurdles because you jumped you jumped over them <laughs> and i think that is beautiful and i think that the fact that you had that drive and that um that 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 boldness that allowed you to keep going you you were motivated you said, I cannot go home and tell my daughter that this is not possible. I need at least one to show that, yes, this is possible. How do we make sure or how do we help people uh, not only get highly motivated, but then have the tools to actually to know what to do from an intellectual property standpoint, from a manufacturing standpoint? How do we how do we connect those resources and those materials? Um, Ruth, you mentioned the fact that you know, not everyone is going to have that social network. They're not going to have, you know, the neighbor or um, a church member or um, someone in the community. Carol, you pointed out that it takes everybody, that it's it's not just um, uh, one group that where the help comes from. So I pose to each one of you, um, what what should be in this strategy? How do we do this? How do we get these resources and these materials in front of people who who need them and who have these great ideas? So we can start up top with uh, Ruth because you look like you're dying to say something. I'm dying to say. Well, one thing I think we need to like flip our mindset right from scarcity to abundance. Right? There's abundant talent in this country. There's abundant great ideas, and we should be searching for this talent not waiting for it to like fight its way through a thorny forest to get to us, right? And and um, Rosalind's paths should have been easier, right? So I think um, putting resources into um, people that can serve as those guides for inventors. You know, if, if we as a country are gonna benefit from the economic impact of new businesses, new entrepreneurs of new inventions, there needs to be a resource, someone that you can can reach out to that's an expert. So say if we had um, an organization that had, you know, source experts in like seven, eight different sectors that could be that person who has all those social network connections that can help. So I think there's some ways we should be thinking about this from a talent search perspective versus a, um, you know, wait for them to come to us. 
perspective. And, you know, some in the tech space in computing, there's been a lot of talk of like, we should be recruiting kids, like you recruit for, you know, for sports, we should be recruiting talent. And um, I think we should think the same way about invention. Because inventors don't just invent once, right? They keep inventing. I guess I'd add a few thoughts here, which is um, I think on the talent cultivation side, there's two major things we need to do, although a lot of things underneath that. Um, one is um, the point was made earlier about how important it is to shine a light on women and minority inventors, innovators and entrepreneurs. So kids really begin to believe I could be an inventor, I could be an entrepreneur. I think there's sort of this leap of faith to say, oh, oh, that's something I could possibly could be because as Rosalind pointed out, you know, somebody who looks like me has done a similar thing. But then there's that next step. I think so often we leave it there. We say, oh, well, we just need to, you know, celebrate people and then it'll be the path will be easy. The path is not going to be easy. I mean, here you have a, a story of highly motivated individuals are facing a lot of barriers. So I think on the education side, talent cultivation side, means we also need to, once again, I'm <laughs> sort of a broken record on this, but ensure that every child has the chance to experience that invention, innovation, learn about entrepreneurship. And that means starting at the earliest ages of elementary school, all the way through higher education. It means changing the, the culture in those institutions to one that celebrates that kind of experience and not just rote learning and uh, performance on, you know, very structured tests. Um, it means also, though, that those it requires additional work. You need to do the professional development of the educators. I talked about that before. It also means that the programs need to have cultural relevance to the kids, so that girls, students from diverse backgrounds, so that the experience is such that they can walk away saying, hey, I can be an inventor or entrepreneur. I'm not just I could be, I actually am, you know, an inventor or entrepreneur. I think that's really important. But on that innovation pathway side, we need to break down the barriers. There, there are a lot of barriers right now in access to support and resources, as, as you know, was just pointed out. It's that people don't have the networks and the access. It shouldn't be dependent on your networks and access. And frankly, even when people get in the door, um, there's discrimination that they face just because of who they are and what they look like. There's a, a wonderful young woman um, who tells the story about she started a company with a couple of her collegiate partners that works on a disinfectant material. And she said she would show up for these business plan competitions and they would look at her and they'd say, so who's presenting from your team? Assuming that because she was a diminutive young woman, that she was not the professional resource that was going to get up there on the stage and present and pitch effectively. Well, they've done an amazing job. She's a powerhouse, uh, but that shouldn't be the way it is. So we need to create access to mentors, networks, resources, funding for women and minorities by breaking down the barriers. But also, I think Ruth just pointed out, we have to intentionally seek them out. We see venture capital firms who are finding terrific programs already, even though we haven't built up the pipeline and welcome people to the innovation table, but they have to go out and really deliberately look within those communities to find those great inventor entrepreneurs and bring them to the table. So I think there's a lot that could be done. Well, and to the capital thing, we need more people of color to be successful so that they can be investors because so often the investors are like, well, this isn't relevant to me, so I don't get it. And I think we're missing so many products that serve women and serve people of color. And um, I once went to, a, it was a hackathon for women's health. And one of the big innovations that came out of that was uh, you know, innovations around breast pumps. Like nobody's doing any work on these things because if the bulk of people creating technology and creating products are, basically white and Asian men, we're just gonna miss out on a lot of innovations. And and it's it's costing us in terms of quality of life, it's costing us in terms of of serving people. And also, you know what, we need to women are so good at adapting to communities and resources and buildings and cars and things that weren't built for us. 
like, let's just stop adapting, okay? We don't need to make do with what's not good enough. And um, we need to say yes to things that are better. And the example I always give to illustrate this to kids is I'm like, okay, when you're in the car, where does your mom put her purse? And they're like, on my lap, on my feet. I'm like, why does no car on the market have a place for a purse when half the population carries a purse? Crazy missed opportunity. Now extrapolate that to the way like safety devices are built, airbags, seat belts, you know, the way we interact with technology. If the minds of women are missing from the design of technology, we're missing out. And I think we need to take a look at this very much from this abundance viewpoint. But I think it's really hard when all of the investors are largely white men. That's who has all the money and the wealth to invest. And it makes it really challenging. One person I would flag is Arlen Hamilton, who has a venture firm. And she's specifically identifying and investing in, in um, startups of color led by people of color. And Rosalyn, I, I definitely want to hear your thoughts here. And, and what is echoing in my mind is just we are the ones that we have been waiting for. But oh, please go on. <laughs> no, that, that, that is so good. And there have been so many things that have shared that are just so good. I, and I love how this conversation is about solutions. Um, and I wouldn't expect anything less from the USBTO. Uh, but the exposure, I cannot stress that enough. Girls seeing girls who look like them doing and solving problems that are relatable. You know, Joyce, when you mentioned, you know, I remember my barrettes turning around. I think a lot of times when you say invention and science and math, a lot of times girls' thoughts may be going to things that are a lot more complex than they think of versus real life, everyday problem solving. Um, so that has been a lot of, you know, when, when Gabby speaks to students, she speaks to schools and, and speaks to girls, it's about problem solving. So it doesn't seem so mystical and beyond, uh, you know, people's reach. You have problems every day that you can solve, you can innovate, you can uh, engineer, re-engineer. Uh, so just that exposure to people who look like them solving relatable problems really gets those wheels turning you know in our academy we've got girls who are coming up with products constantly um and some don't you know make it very far but i just love that they're thinking about that now i am exposed to someone who looks like me who solved a relatable problem i'm thinking about okay I, i'm tired of the crayons always breaking in my box <laughs> And just going through the process of, okay, what, what does that look like? What is a better crayon box? And so we went through this experiment with this little girl and her mom in our academy. You know, it didn't, hasn't gone very far, but I just love that the girl is thinking about breaking, you know, broken crayons is a problem for me. And I need to figure out how to solve that. And she's seven. Uh, so that is definitely uh, at the beginning uh, a thing. And I, I'm thinking about a conversation I had with, uh, city government, which did not go anywhere, but I, it came to my remembrance this morning. We were literally figuring out how could we duplicate or scale the concept and curriculum of the academy in their housing project. And I, I love that we had the conversation. Like I said, it didn't go anywhere. There was a change in staff, but we've got to get these different entities and, and partners together at the table Okay, let's expose our children to people who look like them, who've done relatable problem solving things. And okay, how can we scale what that is? Yeah, and let's, let's get them speaking at assemblies. Let's get them, you know, doing virtual graduation programs. Let's get the children exposed, but then let's give these children an opportunity through an academy, through, you know, through some type of education uh, after school, during school classes uh, where they're continually touched and continually have an opportunity to continue to think about problem solving. You know, can we bring county governments together? Can we bring city governments together? Can we target um, certain populations? When we were talking to the city, they wanted to target the women in their housing uh, development and help them develop businesses with their girls. 
we know that we can close the wealth gap if we do more to invest in black women. Uh, black women entrepreneurs in particular, since we are the population that is starting businesses more than any other population. Uh, so, you know, they were really thinking strategically, okay, how can we scale and, and get what you're doing to the residents that we have here, the housing projects. So, you know, creative ideas like that. I love what the Girl Scouts are doing, particularly with, with the badges. So tapping into uh, nationwide, worldwide organizations like the work, the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, you know, Boys and Girls Club, I, I mean, uh, and then city governments, county governments, state governments, all of those people partnering together. And, you know, what was just mentioned related to the funding, and, and that was, that was, you know, honestly a, a big hurdle. And we've certainly had people who didn't look like us be advocates for us. Uh, but my daughter was exposed to probably more no's or more, you're cute, but I don't understand what you're trying to do. <laughs> I just, that just made a very long word. <laughs> um, then I probably would have liked to because we are in South Carolina. And every time we did go to any of these rooms, she literally was the only black girl there. Uh, but outside of me, there was no one else of color there. You know, we were pitching in boardrooms to white men, and many of them were bald, you know, so they didn't even have hair. So that definitely was a disconnect. When we're talking about barrettes. I mean, we couldn't even do a demonstration with the hair. I mean, it had nothing to put the barrette on. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, having people who've gone through this process and empowered. And I, I pray one day I am blessed to be able to invest in other startups, but we are doing what we can right now. And that is sharing and mentoring and coaching other moms and daughters at the level that we can uh, until we have the funds that we're able to invest in these ideas and help to resolve the problems of broken crayons and anything else that a girl imagines that she can solve. Thank you very much, Rosalind. And I, I would be remiss if I, I did not mention um, that um, there is a, a wonderful children's book out there called Abby Breaks, no, Abby Invents Unbreakable Crayons, <laughs> which um, actually it follows the story of a little girl who comes up with a way to uh, have crayons that don't break. And I love the fact that this children's book actually shows a little girl um, who is going through the invention process. She is a problem solver. And, and there's a mantra in the book that says something like, I am a prop, no, I, I'm a problem solver. I solve problems big and small because I have great ideas. And we really need to figure out how we make sure that all our kids know you have great ideas and you are a problem solver and you can, you know, solve problems big and small. And it, it is it is possible. It's hard work. Um, sometimes there are barriers that you have to overcome, but you can do it because here are all these other examples. I, lo I love that, um, that, that you, you drew that out. Um, and one thing yeah. I, I did want to say is that Gabby said to me that he'd come up with a new way to deal with no. Um, no yeah. just means, um, and you tell us, mom. <laughs> uh, yeah. So right after a $50,000 no, uh, Gabby was just nine years old at the time. It was a $50,000 no in front of a live audience of about 500 people. Uh, so I'm getting chills just remembering what that was like. And I'm 43, <laughs> but she was nine at the time and had just been told no came in second for $50,000. Second means you get nothing. <laughs> you don't know. Um, they had a camera in her face, like immediately afterwards, which is, that's that's media for you. Um, but, and she, she mumbled something, but then she said in the camera, just a straight face, she said, no, it's just an abbreviation for next opportunity. And everybody's jaw dropped. The cameraman was like, and then somebody beside me was like, did you get that? <laughs> uh, and she's been saying that ever since. No is just an abbreviation for next opportunity. And, and like I mentioned, she certainly experienced more of those than I could have ever imagined between seven and 14 years old. Uh, but that is what kept us going, has kept us being persistent and has made her super resilient. 
uh, and you know any parents watching right now that that is what I, I tell any parent and your, your child does not have to be an entrepreneur or an inventor even if their gifting is soccer or or dance or, or something else um, that we're not particularly discussing today exposing your children to rejection exposing them to those risks certainly builds a type of resilience that will carry them far in life Russell, yeah, that's I, an incredible point. I, I just, um, God, and what, what uh, brilliance on her part to come up with that in the moment. I wouldn't have thought of it, but it's incredible. I, I think it's part of why we really need to change fundamentally the way we do education, because if you think about the way we currently educate, um, and I see this experience with my own kids who are grown now, but, you know, you're supposed to do it in one way, right? There's only one answer, there's only one approach. If you don't get it right on the first test, it's not about, oh, let's let's take you to the next, let's get you to that level, right? It's like, no, you did it wrong, you got a bad grade, you know, you are not good. I just think that there's a huge opportunity through experience, this kind of iterative, because that's really what both invention and entrepreneurship about this iterative experience of failing and going on. I love her next opportunity, you know, going to that next opportunity. If we could get all kids to have that kind of resilience, what an amazing country we would have. What an amazing planet we would have. I, I really think just brilliant. We, we need a daughter like framed on an inventor card. <laughs> well, and I want to sort of just elevate this idea of it's about the process. Right, so it's not that every idea you have is going to make it to market or going to be the one. It's about the process of figuring it out and learning. And I remember I had this little girl who, she wanted to be able to sort her nail polish by color. She had a lot of nail polish. So she designed this whole machine that would like use a light sensor to to recognize the, the color and then a little, it had like a conveyor and a bunch of stuff. Was this a marketable product? Probably not. But the fact that a 12 year old spent the time to understand enough about conveyors and light sensors and, and the technology behind all of that, that was what was powerful about her excitement about that idea. And so the process of figuring it out, and I remember having, um, um, the little girl who did the base space hand thing, she went through so many different chem, like materials engineering experiments. And I had a whole box and I remember flying with her to the International Science Fair and I had this plastic box full of all these different things. I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna get through security with this box of plastics of different shapes and different materials, but it was a whole, the process of her figuring out what was the right material, that was what was super powerful. Thank you, Ruth. And I, I don't know where the time has gone, uh, <laughs> but we, we are almost to the end of our time. And so I did want very briefly just to give you an opportunity to say a last, I, I guess, word, if you will, um, regarding um, this topic of pathways and again, moving forward. Um, and thank you all so much again. Uh, Rosalind, uh, let me go to you really quickly, and then uh, Ruth and Carol. I really hope that anyone watching has been inspired by all of the stories that have been shared and the amazing feats that the, 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 one, the women on this panel have, have accomplished. Uh, I hope by hearing our story that you are inspired to go out looking for problems to solve. Uh, and if you are in a position to help empower another Gabby that's in your neighborhood, in your community, in your school, in your Girl Scout troop, um, to take an idea and to you know teach them that really nothing is impossible if they really put the, the work in toward it um, and you be that support system. Whether you're in a nonprofit organization or community organization or you're a government official, really take some of these amazing ideas that were shared today. And this really was a problem solving uh, session. Uh, so you've got <laughs> plenty of things that you can work on, whether it's exposure, um, investing, uh, you know, county governments, uh, community organizations. There's so many nuggets that were shared as far as things you can do. If you just commit to doing one thing, taking one thing, 
and you may be inspiring and helping the next Gabby. Thank you, Rosalyn. Ruth and then Carol. That's fantastic. So um, obviously if you're a parent or an educator um, or an adult in a child's life, I want you to absolutely like open your mind about who has potential and you know, see abundance and opportunity in every child. If you are an engineer or a technologist or a tinkerer or an inventor yourself, please, for Women's History Month, call the Girl Scouts. They have thousands and thousands and millions of girls who want to do these badges and their leaders don't necessarily have the skills to do that. So you can be a volunteer. You can go help a troop with an invention badge, with an engineering badge, and um, there's a massive shortage of volunteers. So that is an easy thing you could do. Just do one badge event for one troop. You could do it on Zoom. So if you're an engineer, there's an action item for you. Shameless plug here before I go to Carol. You can also help them with their intellectual property patch, which is a program that was introduced by the USPTO in collaboration with um, the Intellectual Property Owners Education Foundation and Girl Scouts of the nation's capital, but it's all over, not just in Washington, D.C. So, awesome. <laughs> Carol, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I just, uh, I think actually the comments made already were so eloquent, particularly Rosalind's. I think the point is we all need to commit to this because it's not just important for uh, the individual girls and the individual people, but it is hugely important for them. It is important for all of us. It's important for our country. It's the way we're going to have better ideas. We're going to have more ideas. We're going to have a better economy and better jobs for everyone. I really think we need to commit personally, as was being said, we all have a role to play in this. And if nothing else, I encourage all of you to look at inventioneducation.org to really see the transformative effect that this has on individual kids and on the educators who are helping them through this journey. Um, if you can get behind and support this in your own communities to demand it in your own schools, I think it's, it's the number one thing we can do to really change things for all children coming through the public school system. Thank you so much, um, Ruth and Rosalind and Carol. And uh, I turn it back over to the very capable hands of Nathania Ferguson and Sean Wilkerson from the USPTO Office of Innovation Outreach. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Joyce, for leading today's discussion and our panelists, Ruth, Carol, Rosalind, for giving us so much information, resources, and inspiration to encourage young women, young women to be innovators. This was an absolutely amazing panel. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to introduce Nathania Ferguson. She works here at USPTO in the Office of Innovation Outreach as our manager, and she will be closing today's program. Nathania, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean, for the introduction. And thank you, Joyce, Ruth, Carol, and Rosalind for that rich conversation that should leave all of us thinking about what we can do to inspire and motivate girls to become inventors and entrepreneurs. What actions can we take to empower and support young women pursuing their dreams to have STEM careers or starting their own business? So, speaking of action, the USPTO actively supports all inventors and entrepreneurs. So, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about some of our programs and resources that may be of interest. First slide. So, Joyce and her team, the Office of Education, will conduct a virtual National Summer Teacher Institute, also referred to as NSTI, in July. Workshops at the NSTI will cover a broad range of topics in intellectual property, STEM education, and invention and entrepreneurship. Presentation speakers and workshop instructors include subject matter experts from the USPTO, other federal government agencies, and organizations. For more information about NSTI, please visit USPTO.gov forward slash teacher institute. The Office of Education is currently offering two monthly programs for K-12 educators. The last month, the last Tuesday of the month, there is an intellectual property workshop. Participants will learn about the different types of intellectual property. 
the last Wednesday of the month, attend office hours to obtain answers to questions about intellectual property and learn more about USPTO resources. Links to obtain information about the monthly programs are available on the USPTO events page at uspto.gov forward slash events. If you have questions about NSTI or the monthly programs for K-12 educators, please send your email to education at uspto.gov. Next slide, please. The USPTO's kids pages contain many great resources for our creative children and their parents and teachers. On the kids page, you can find inspirational stories about young innovators, fun hands-on activities, and some really cool intellectual property lesson plans for elementary, middle, and high school students. To access USPTO's kids pages, please visit USPTO dot gov forward slash kids. Next slide, please. Each month, our Journeys of Innovation series tell stories of inventors and entrepreneurs who have made positive impacts in the world. For example, this month's story focuses on Juliet Gordon Lowe's remarkable accomplishment of founding and growing the Girl Scouts. Please visit USPTO.gov to learn more about Lowe's story and other inspiring stories of amazing innovators who may serve as role models for our young inventors and entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. The Patent and Trademark Resource Centers, also referred to as PTRCs, are a great resource. They are designated by the USPTO to support, to support the diverse IP needs of the public. As you can see from this map, they are located throughout the US. Most PTRCs are located in a city, county, college, or university library. PTRCs, PTRC librarians help inventors and small businesses find the information they need to protect their intellectual property. They provide information about patent and trademark processes. They will not provide legal advice, however, they will show you a directory of local patent attorneys that are licensed to practice before the USPTO. For more information about PTRCs and to find a PTRC closest to you, please visit uspto.gov forward slash PTRC. Next slide, please. I wanna thank all of our virtual attendees for spending your time with us today. I hope you will be joining us for our next three WES programs. Registration is now open for next week's program on Wednesday, March the 17th. We are excited about having subject matter experts share valuable information about federal government resources. You do not want to miss learning about free legal, sorry, free legal services and programs and resources to help protect your invention, brand, or creative work. On March 24th, our panel of experts will, will share information about securing funding for your invention or small business. On March 31st, we will conclude the WES series by hearing from successful women entrepreneurs. For links to more information about and how to register for upcoming WES programs, please visit our events page at uspto.gov forward slash events. While you are on our events page, I encourage you to check out the many other free virtual intellectual property education and awareness programs that are available. You will be receiving a short survey for today's program. Please complete it. We value your feedback. Your input is important in creating future programs to meet the needs of our customers. Thanks again for attending today's program. We look forward to you joining us next week. Goodbye.